Greetings all and welcome to another session here of 2Z Talks. Today we are going to continue our discussion on mastering ESL and bilingual methods. Today, in fact, we're going to be focusing on sheltered instruction and we'll do a little bit of investigation into PSYOP. Now, most of this information or a lot of this information is coming right out of Herrera and Murray's book, Mastering ESL and Bilingual Methods. That's the book that's right over there. You can certainly um, go out and buy this book if you're interested. You can get it at Barnes & Noble or order it online through something like Amazon. Okay, let's jump right into the uh, main uh, attraction for today. It's going to be sheltered instruction and uh, the met that method. We'll look at some of the realities related to sh the uh, sheltered instruction approach. We'll also look at some myths or some things that people have said that uh, limit uh, sheltered instruction. Um, oddly enough, I've not heard any of these before uh, reading this text, but we'll look at them anyway. We'll also look at Sadie, which is another approach that I have never heard of prior to this book. I believe it comes out of California. Um, but we will look at that, and then we'll look at PSYOP, which is probably the most popular uh, sheltered instruction uh, approach that's out there. Um, so, let's just jump right in here. <clears throat> we'll look at some of the realities of the sheltered uh, instruction approach. Now, Herrera and Murray go on and list a whole bunch of these, and they begin by saying, you know, some of these do not work, are not focused on in, uh, in the sheltered approach, and that others are. And uh, I'm, I'm going to have to disagree, because I'm certain that a lot of these are used that way. Um, with regard to the science and the, the second language acquisition theories that are out there, uh, the latest theories that I have come across indicate that you should be using an amalgamation of the different theories that are out there. So, for example, you should have a time where you focus on discrete language. Okay, now in the sheltered approach they say you don't do that, but in actuality you can. Um, I find that it uh, happens like an object lesson. You're focusing... Let's just say, for example, you're studying uh, history. You're talking about uh, uh, history in the uh, in the uh, in Europe during uh, during World War One. And as you're reading this information, all of a sudden, some student raises their hand and says, "Excuse me, what what does this sentence mean?" Okay, now you have an opportunity to jump into grammar, uh, to jump into uh, syntax, or jump into vocabulary and focus on those discrete items. Um, so, and that's where they were talking, uh, where, where researchers will talk about focusing on form. <clears throat> that in the middle of focusing on content, you have an opportunity to focus on form because everybody's attention is there. So, they, Herrera and Murray, will say, no, I will say, no, sometimes you do. In fact, it's a good thing that you have opportunities like that so that you can have everybody focus in on that. <clears throat> um, they also say that if you're going to be uh, doing... Um, uh, the sheltered approach, you probably wouldn't be using a content-specific e uh, instructor. In other words, you're not going to have someone who's just a history teacher uh, teaching ESL, okay? Or someone who's, I'm sorry, someone who's a, a content, a history teacher teaching in the sheltered approach. Well, at, that can be done. You can have a language specialist, or I'm sorry, a history specialist who is also teaching uh, in this approach. So it can be done sometimes. Um, and so that's what I'm thinking of here. So I, I, I would disagree with them again. That there's an emphasis on all literacy skills, okay? And uh, they're going to probably agree with that. And I would say, well, usually that's the case, yeah, unless you're dealing with uh, certain types of English for specific purposes. Um, you know, the military, they try to set up language uh, education for a specific thing. If you're going to be a translator, you're just listening to a foreign language, well, there's no need for you necessarily to speak or write. <clears throat> you're simply translating. So there will be less emphasis on all four skills in that area. Now, for most people who are watching the video, of course, you're going to be teaching in some type of a school, and the majority of you, their focus is on uh, language usage, both inside the class and outside the class. So you're going to be dealing with all four skills. <clears throat> there are, of course, places where they're focusing on passing a test. They want their students to be able to pass a TOEFL test, so they're going to be focusing on reading, writing, <clears throat> and uh, speaking, and those are the main areas that they're going to focus on. So... It'll be different depending on wherever, but it's usually the case that you deal with all four skills. The goal is language development. Well, of course, that's going to be the case. That's not going to be only for the sheltered approach. The sheltered approach is going to be teaching content, but the end game is language development. That's going to be the case for nearly everything else, even, even if you're dealing with survival skills. You know, I had a student one time when I was living overseas, wanted to go to Australia for a month. 
He didn't want to be able to speak, uh, you know, about philosophy. He wanted to be able to go into a restaurant. He wanted to be able to go to a hotel. He wanted to be able to say, I needed help. And so those were just survival skills. But is that language development? Yes, that was his goal. It wasn't as robust or as deep, but it still would have been <clears throat> language development. All right, focusing on high-frequency vocabulary. Absolutely. I know of no program other than specific ES. P, English for Specific Purposes, where the goal would not be focusing on high-frequency vocabulary. <clears throat> you deal with the vocabulary that is most often used, those top 3,000 words. Okay, next thing that the sheltered approach would focus on would be core curriculum. Okay, and the core curriculum is usually comes out of uh, the state or the organization that uh, is uh, sponsoring the courses. And yeah, you want to focus on core curriculum. So you're going to be studying history or science or mathematics or geography or, or something like that. And that, uh, that core curriculum, that core content or concepts, uh, you're going to be focusing on those. Yes, you will be. Of course, you're going to have added to that some of uh, the sheltered uh, um, uh, helps that you're going to provide for your ESL student. Uh, following a specific scope and sequence. And again, I look at this and I say, well, of course, uh, name me a course or a program that any program, be it, uh, you know, medical biology or uh, astrophysics, uh, that doesn't have some sort of scope and sequence. And so, yeah, of course that's going to be there. Uh, lastly, uh, the sheltered approach is going to include bilingual educators. It's not necessary that you have bilingual educators, but it's definitely a plus. Now, let me talk a little bit about bi bilingual in the sense of two languages. Yeah, it would be definitely a plus if you had two languages. It would definitely be a plus if your history teacher also understood the sheltered approach. Uh, it would definitely be a plus in that sense. <clears throat> now, again, Herrera and Murray are saying, well, you want to have a certified uh, sheltered approach uh, teacher who understands the history of it when they're teaching this particular material. Of course, certified can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. The point is, if you're doing sheltered approach, you've got two things that you ought to know. You ought to know language, you know, linguistics, uh, all the components in linguistics, and then you also need to know the content uh, that you're focusing on. So you've got extra work that you need to do, and that doesn't always happen. Herrera and Murray are right in that case. There are times where you're having a history teacher who knows history, but doesn't know language, and so that's a disadvantage. The opposite is also true. You're going to have to do your homework if you're going to be doing um, uh, the sheltered approach. By the way, I think it's a great idea. This is one of the best ways I know of uh, teaching language because there's more going on than just language learning. All right, <clears throat> some uh, sheltered um, method commonalities. And these are things that, again, Herrera and Murray listed uh, as things that you'll find common in many of these sheltered approach uh, types of programs. One is hands-on activities, okay? And I would agree, hands-on activities is going to be a plus. Uh, this is uh, in line with things like uh, task-based uh, past based language learning. I try to say that three times while you're drinking too many margaritas. Um, hands-on activities, where they're actually getting involved with um, the learning process with some type of physical um, or, you know, things that they have to do uh, activities. Definitely going to help the learning process. Cooperative learning or group learning, where they're in small groups or they're in pairs and they're having to complete some kind of uh, procedure or task within the learning process. And again, you can do this for history or geography or um, uh, science, uh, all that can be done. But cooperative learning is definitely a plus. I would add to this, uh, I would add uh, competitive learning. Um, so I love working in groups, but it's even more fun, again, Keep an eye on that affective filter. You don't want it too high. You don't want it too low. You want it just right. With, co with competitive learning, you're going to have students who are going to be competing against one another, and they're going to be more motivated most of the time, many times, to want to complete a task. So you work in groups. That's definitely a plus. Iron sharpens iron. But you can also work uh, in, in competition. All right, their next point here, guarded vocabulary. Uh, and really what they're talking about is high-frequency vocabulary. Do not give all this vocabulary so that students do not learn. You do any research by uh, Nation or Schmidt or Lauke, and uh, you'll know that within the realm of vocabulary, there's a very high percentage of the vocabulary a student needs to know um, in order for them to understand. So you want to focus on the high-frequency vocabulary, or what they would say guarded vocabulary. 
Herrera and Murray also talk about speaking more slowly, which I absolutely disagree with. Um, bear in mind, there are different speeds for different peoples. I tend to speak more quickly. Um, probably closer to somebody who has uh, the speed of speaking like in New York uh, City. They tend to speak more quickly. People from other parts of the world, as in uh, England or um, you know, Alabama, um, they speak more slowly. So their, their speech is easier to understand. So the point I'm trying to make here is that you don't need, to, you shouldn't be, speak more slowly. Speak at the normal rate. But that doesn't mean that you try to teach them pronunciation. It doesn't mean that you try to teach them how to understand at that particular speed. Okay, so you have to have more emphasis as you're going on here. But they need to understand the speed that you're talking about. I had a great example when I was living overseas in Japan. I attended um, a Japanese church, and almost every Sunday I went. And this one church that I was attending to almost a year, I began to understand what the preacher was saying every Sunday because he spoke at a particular rate. And you got used to that form of speech, so you could understand what he was saying. I could take notes and ask questions later. And one day, a visitor came to speak, and he spoke like a machine gun. And I could not, for the life of me, I strained and strained to try to figure out what he was talking about. I didn't understand, because he was talking too fast. Well, in reality, he wasn't talking too fast. I got used to one voice, and that's not good. Um, so when I teach, I normally teach at a higher rate of speech, and my normal speed. And I tell my students, you get used to my voice. If you can get used to my speed, you're going to be great. You're going to be able to understand a lot of different people because you understand that speed. So my suggestion, speak slower? No. But teach them how to pick up what's being said so that they can understand those differences. So teach pronunciation. That's what you should be doing. Teach spoken language. A uh, great example, I remember I began a class and I said, now first of all today we're going to be studying, you know, the history of, uh, you know, cultural studies. And this kid looks at me like I was on drugs or I was from another planet and he didn't understand first of all. And he looks up the word festival. Festival. And he was trying to figure out what was going on. Later on, he, someone told him what that meant and he was laughing. You know, and I was laughing, obviously, because he just, it was the first pattern matched item that he could hear. Um, later on, we began to, you know, phonetically write on the board thing, the way people speak as opposed to the way things are written down. And it helped that student keep an eye and keep up with what was going on. So speak slower? No. Teach pronunciation and use that guarded vocabulary. Okay, next on the list here is use visuals. And again, I would say, yeah, use every sense that's, a, that's possible. Uh, matches up this hair with the idea with hands-on activities. So use visuals, yeah, use AV as often as you can because it's an extra input pathway for students to try to understand and grapple with the language. Uh, the other point I would stress here is that you focus on those content areas, be it science or literature or social studies or mathematics. Um, whatever those are, you want that's going to be the focus of the class. The focus is not necessarily the language. Now, you as a language teacher, obviously your goal is for language development. But the focus of the class is not language development. The focus of the class is the content. Now, there are a number of things that you're going to want to do in order to make sure that becomes a reality, uh, and we'll look at those shortly. Let's, let's jump on here um, to these myths of sheltered instruction. One myth is that it's designed only for ELL courses, uh, for second language learning courses, for people who come from different cultures and are learning this language. Um, I have never heard this before, um, and uh, ELL uh, courses are where only second language learners are in the course, but you can use sheltered instruction for mixed classes, students that, have, uh, that are native speakers as well as students who are learning language. So you can do this anywhere. That's why I said uh, a history teacher who knows this method can incorporate it into his normal history class, again, to help his second language learners. Next point here is that it was not guarded, uh, grounded in uh, standards of best practice. There's a lot of research. Again, I don't understand why this is a myth, because there's a lot of research out there <clears throat> uh, that talks about sheltered instruction and the advantages and benefits of sheltered instruction. 
Um, so again, I don't understand why that would be a, um, a myth that anyone would want to propagate. I believe these are older myths. Lastly, these are designed for intermediate and advanced second language learners. Now this at least I understand. You're going to find people who will say, well look, they, they're they not going to be able to understand because the vocabulary is too rich or the, <clears throat> the um, syntax is too complex. Um, for the person who's using the sheltered approach, you can modify these things. You can provide supplemental uh, activities for your second language learners so that they can keep up. So I would disagree with this myth, although I understand that this this does appear to be a myth. It's not really the case. It means more work for the teacher, but it certainly can be done and in my opinion motivates your students. And that's a big plus in language learning is motivation. Okay, uh, Herrera and Murray then talk about the uh, the Sadie methodology which was specially designed academic instruction in English. And this is a precursor to uh, the PSYOP model that had come out. And there are a number of things that were involved with SADI. Now, SADI was actually designed more for intermediate and um, advanced students. Uh, so that was actually, it's the way it was designed. So look at that. That was one of the myths. And that's SADI says, well, that's what I'm designed for. SADI also emphasizes cognitive grade level core material. So again, you're focusing on content. You're focusing on core curriculum content at grade level. So if it's third grade content, this because this person's in third grade, well, that's what you're going to focus on. And you're going to emphasize that. And so that's uh, another plus for the, the SADI approach. You also try to create opportunities for social interaction. You're going to try opportunities for your students to interact with one another and interact with people outside. What are we doing? Cooperative learning, right? discovery-based learning. So that's going to be opportunities for social interaction. You want to have access with the core, core curriculum. Again, you want to find out what that core curriculum is and use that as part of your scope and sequence so that these students will be on task with the, uh, with the learning just like, just like your uh, non-language uh, limited uh, students are. Um, again, the goal is going to be English language development, just like it was for the regular sheltered approach information that we looked at earlier. We're going to use cooperative learning. Again, you're going to work in groups and small groups uh, and pairs and ways to help uh, people sharpen their skills against one another. And you're going to have some type of modified instruction and assessment. Now, this to me is the core to any type of sheltered approach, modified instruction and assessment. Um, so, for example, you're going to pre-teach vocabulary, for sure, because you're going to run into vocabulary that these students are not going to know. They're going to need to learn in order to interact and do the, the cooperative learning and to have interaction opportunities and also to interact with the core curriculum. You're going to need to know that vocabulary. So you're going to need to modify your instruction in order to give them opportunities to learn this vocabulary prior to actually jumping into the vocabulary. Assessment as well, you're not only going to be assessing <clears throat> their content knowledge, but you're going to be assessing their language ability. So you're not just going to be giving them a test, be it a paper or a written test, or having them write a paper or give a presentation. You're going to be monitoring other things as well. So assessment will be modified in this process. It's going to be the same for the PSYOP when we get to it. Okay, and so that's the SADI, the specially designed academic instruction in English. I haven't seen this anywhere except in this text. I believe it did come from California. You can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and it seems to me like a very good uh, procedure and, and uh, approach for teaching language. The more popular model that's out there is the PSYOP model, the Sheltered Instruction Observation Protocol. Now, you understand sheltered instruction, and there's uh, we've already explained it not only at the beginning, but also in the previous slide with, uh, with um, uh, Sadie. And a lot of that information is going to be the same. What's going to be different beyond the eight steps that are here is the observation protocol part. Okay, and the observation protocol is a protocol that they used to try and say, hey, this is uh, what we're going to do. We are also going to observe the teacher and give them a grade to help them get better. Okay, and that's, uh, that's the OP of the, this, uh, this uh, lesson here, of this of this uh, method here. Um, PSYOP is very popular and very uh, much in the growing phase right now. Um, PSYOP, just to let you know, did come from the US. It probably came out of a, a need for something like uh, the No Child Left Behind and so they began to look at sheltered instruction. Uh, prior to things like Sadie and PSYOP, 
Uh, Content-based learning was very uh, well used uh, overseas. And uh, the CBI, content-based instruction, where you were teaching language through content. Uh, so that was used very often. Um, there was research on it, but there weren't a lot of books necessarily out there. Uh, the government uh, had jumped in with something like No Child Left Behind, and then this approach became much more popular. It includes eight steps or eight uh, components, and uh, these are all listed here. Lesson preparation, building background, comprehensible input, strategies, interaction, practice application, lesson delivery, and review and assessment. Uh, most of this all has to do with uh, the sheltered instruction. The review and assessment also has to do with the observation protocol. How well did I do all these steps? Um, in, with each, each one of these steps, there's a breakdown of information, that, uh, information and tips that need to go on as you look through this. Uh, Herrera and Murray do a fairly nice job of uh, trying to explain all of these steps. Uh, and some of this do already does make sense. They're talking about lesson preparation, the extra materials and extra things that you need to be thinking about as you do. Trying to build uh, background knowledge, trying to bring their schema into your classroom so that you can help them understand more quickly. Comprehensible input, of course, you know from crashing. Uh, comprehensible input, make sure that the information you're giving them is something that they understand or is just, just a little step beyond what they understand. Nice thing about Sheltered Approach uh, Observation Protocol or PSYOP is that they do emphasize strategies and they're talking about metacognitive strategies, cognitive strategies, and socio-affective strategies to help them learn language. And there are ways that you, strategies that you can use to help you master language learning. And they ought to be taught. And it's a nice thing that PSYOP includes, uh, includes them. And by the way, there are a lot of books uh, out there that you could see. There's uh, one that's listed right here uh, by, um, uh, I forget, Her uh, Echeverria, Yot, and one other person. I forget who it is. Um, but they're excellent books. You can go find those online and uh, use this. Uh, even, even if you don't use the observation protocol part of it within your, within your school, uh, you can certainly learn about this whole uh, approach and the benefits that are there. Now, I'm not going to go into the specifics uh, through this particular book. I'm going to be going to this nice summary. Uh, and you can go here and take a look at it. Um, it's a little summary of the, of the PSYOP model. And uh, includes the eight components and 30 features. That's a wonderful little summary. It's 18 pages long. And uh, you're going to be able to look at all eight of these. Okay, lesson preparation. And then they go into the details here for lesson preparation. And you're going to look, see all the, some of the details that go along with this, right? Uh, you're going to have content objectives. You're going to have language objectives. Again, this is just the preparation stage. Um, you're going to have little tips as you go along, right? You're going to have little tips as you're going along. And here are some skills associated with uh, content. This isn't actually part of PSYOP, but I think it's a nice thing to have. Adapting content. That's something you're going to do. You may want to use graphic organizers. Uh, you're going to use outlines and highlighting, jigsaw. Those are fun. Leveled guided studies. So if you're going to have a guided study, you may want to, you're going to have to modify it so that it fits to your particular level. <clears throat> okay, and after they're done with lesson planning, they go on to building background. And they, they have a nice little summary of how you try to build background. Uh, here's a concept map. Uh, we'll think that there's a math vocabulary type of a game. Comprehensible input. The next point here, right, and how you try to modify speech so that it's appropriate to your students so they can understand. You're going to have scaffolding, different ways of doing questions and interacting. and How time and waiting is uh, very important, especially culturally, and trying to explain to your students the differences between their culture and your culture. Um, so, again, I'm not going to go through all of this, but it's a great little uh, summary to have. I would recommend that you look through it <clears throat> so that you can understand more of the PSYOP model. Um, PSYOP textbooks are available online, but they're, they are a little costly. Something like this is just a wonderful thing to have because it goes through all 18 steps and it does provide you with um, some good uh, tips and uh, gives you a good summary and synopsis of um, the PSYOP model. Now, if you actually want to do the OP part of this, the observation protocol part of this, you'll want to get the textbooks, uh, the PSYOP textbooks, because they include some good descriptions of the observation protocol. And really what the observation protocol is actually about is that you assess yourself. You review, okay, how well did I do these eight steps? How well did I, did I incorporate these 30 features 
as I was teaching, and I can grade myself, okay? And again, the purpose of it is for you to say, okay, this I did well, this I didn't do well. I need to improve uh, this area, okay? And there are some schools that'll take the PSYOP model and use it for their entire uh, bilingual or ESL uh, program, and they can grade each other, again, for the purpose of making the program uh, stronger. So it's a nice, a nice way to set that up. And that's the PSYOP model. Again, you can go to this particular link. I think it's a great little link to have uh, to get uh, that handout that I was just showing you. Of course, you can go online and purchase uh, PSYOP books if you are interested. And that's the sheltered instruction and the PSYOP model uh, out of uh, the... Uh, lesson that we're going to have today, Mastering ESL and Bilingual Methods. If you do have any questions, you can shoot me a message down below or you can certainly uh, email me and I'll be glad to help you. You guys have a great day and I'll talk to you again later. Bye-bye now.